I've always loved cinematography. So, one of the things that YBS asked me to do when I got there was not only to be a fighter, but to record and share my experiences. One, two, three. Which is pretty fun for me. So in this film, I'll not only share my experiences, but hopefully I'll be able to shed a light on this war that the world has seemed to have forgotten about. This door is gonna fly. Let's put some stuff on it. Eh? Go, 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 go. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Fuck yeah! We have to feel that. To feel it? <laughs> Let me teach yeah. you. Oh man. Before we get started, I think it's kind of important that I explain why did I come here? How did it come down to this? There's a lot of reasons, but I'll keep it nice and quick for you guys. In 2015, I started my adult life by joining the Marine Corps. But I ended up getting out early because of some medical issues uh, after two years. And, God, that was, a, that was a rough time. But it taught me a lot about life. You know, the Marine Corps was sort of my dad at the time. I tried living a normal life as well. But, to be honest, it didn't really work out for me. So, uh, after a lot of thought and deliberation, I decided I would go to Syria and join the YPG which is a very similar group to the YBS. It was a great time. I really enjoyed it, learned a lot, the language, the culture, the revolution. But I spent so much time on Instagram and YouTube that I felt like I didn't get what I wanted out of the experience. So I always felt when I came back home, I should have done more. I should have stayed away from my phone. After seven months with the YPG, I ended up coming back home. I wasn't ready for a normal life just yet. So I ended up building a van home with my dad and I traveled the states for a year in that. And about halfway through the travels, I realized I gotta go back. I can't end it here. I gotta do it right this time. And that's when my YBS experience really starts. When I made the decision that I was gonna go back, but there's gonna be no YouTube, no Instagram. I was gonna go back for the right reasons. When you make the decision to come to the mountains of Sinjar and join YBS, there's a lot of things going through your head. Am I gonna get arrested when I get back home? Should I write a will? There's so many different things, but at some point, you just gotta throw yourself at it, and that's exactly what I did. When you look at Sinjar from a satellite view, it looks like any other Iraqi landscape. Mud hut villages, sand everywhere. But any Turkish drone pilot will tell you, the mountains are alive. You just gotta look a little deeper. Yeah, for 13 months of my life, I lived in tunnels. You can call me a caveman, but what I call myself is a gorilla. All throughout history, you can look at examples of tunnels being used as defensive positions. The Marines attacking Iwo Jima, the tunnel rats of Vietnam, and most recently, the Taliban who resisted 20 years in the tunnels of Afghanistan. One of the fundamentals of guerrilla warfare is freedom of movement. So when you live in Iraq, which is mostly desert, the use of tunnels was an obvious choice. Sounds good. What's up, buddy? They're still bombing. They're still bombing. All right, get inside. 
I'm getting Kamal. Hey, Kamal, get inside! I heard that, man. What was that? No Kashif. Like, I don't hear any Kashifs. I heard Kashifs, so I started, you know, going back inside. Yeah. And then behind me, like, clearly. Three. At the bottom. All right, close the door. We might be next. Yeah, close the door with uh, all three safeties. We're staying in. Man, I fucking knew it, dude. I had a bad feeling about that drone. It sounded different. It just fucking sounded different. Okay, so I'm with five. Kamal's going five so. Yeah, go to Mezzi two. Okay, all right. And I'm gonna be in between. I'm gonna be going back and forth. And you tell me what you hear. If you hear anything, you fall back. The YBS have a lot of enemies, but by far the most feared is the Turkish military. Turkey, being the second largest NATO army, has a lot at their disposal. State-of-the-art Bayraktar drones and Akinci drones, F-16 fighter jets given by the USA. There's pretty much nothing they're willing to hold back. But as a guerrilla, you are only limited by your own mind. When the enemy covers your skies with drones and jets, you go into the tunnels. If you're cut outside, you disperse. And we're gonna switch the dispersion to 25 meters. But most important of all, is to have good company. And I had that out there. <laughs> oh no, no, no. <laughs> What the fuck? Come on. Go, dude, let's go! Alright, thanks, thanks. Alright, let's go. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Gorgeous. Say hola. Hola. You want water? Poco. <laughs> Bahu's coming in clutch. Fun <laughs> goes away! Dude, that's a giant spider, man. Frag out! Explode! I'm gonna send this to the university. Was that the last load? <laughs> what the fuck? Break out! Break out! Exploit! I had some really fun times with my buddies, but as you may have guessed, it wasn't always that way. There were some ups and downs, as the human condition dictates. What are we doing, Kamal? What's going on? I see that bolt you're cleaning? Well, yeah, cleaning very good these fantastic bullets. Awesome bullets that they sent us to clean. It's gonna work flawlessly. It's not gonna blow up in the dish at all. And we have a little bit more to clean, I guess. Not just bullets. It is absolutely crazy, man. We have to clean all of this. And there's so many difficulties that affect morale. I mean, just think about it. 
None of her parents wanted us to come here. We had to leave jobs, leave school, and we traded the comfort of Western life in order to come and live in caves, have no electricity at times, no potable water, and to learn a new language and a new culture all in a time span of about a year. Not to mention, you have to work and live and fight with everybody that comes here, no matter who they are or what reasons brought them here. But I can honestly say, despite all of these hurdles, I, for myself, was able to maintain my morale. Oh, okay. oh home sweet home. And I'm sure my comrades would say the same about me. Now when we talk about comrades, it's not just the international team. Most of the days we spent with the Kurds, with the Arabs, the Yazidis. We had to learn their culture, the language, their own rules. And we learned about the revolution and what it cost to live freely. Hundreds of women, men, Kurds, Yazidis, Arabs alike spent their lives in order to create democratic confederalism here in Sinjar. As you drive down streets or you go into a house, you can't miss the faces of the martyrs that they post everywhere. The martyrs who gave their lives in order to guarantee freedom in this corrupt, war-torn nation. The idea of democratic confederalism is that each village can choose for themselves what is best for them, what rules work, what customs and courtesies. And that's how Iraq worked for all of history. But it was only a hundred years ago when the UK and France created the nation states we know today as the Middle East. Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, all these countries were created under one rule of law. And this doesn't work for modern day Mesopotamia, where each village has their own religion, has their own ideas of the world. So democratic confederalism is bringing it all back, giving the power to the people to decide who they want to be. So when we talk about the defenders of Sinjar, there's actually a pretty large subset of them that devote their life to the cause. Many of them came to Sinjar from northern Kurdistan, which is located in Turkey. So they don't have an option to come back home. So you can imagine just how devoted they are to the cause. Now for us internationals, we were placed in a Kurdish unit, which meant we had to learn the language. We had to do the same work as them. And that also meant a lot of restrictions. To name just a few of the rules that the Kurds hold themselves to. No t-shirts in front of a woman. No drinking energy drinks. No alcohol. No shisha. No cell phones. No pictures. Seriously? Yeah. Wallah. No relationships? That means no sex. Whoa! And last but not least, you can't make money. <laughs> These are some of the rules, but luckily, because of democratic confederalism, they allowed us to have our own culture as well. <laughs> and our culture includes a lot of shenanigans. Steaming <laughs> hot. Open up. We're coming. Allah. Allah, shall we? Allah, shall we? Runa, Runa, Runa. You say please? You say please? Chai. Mark, kill me. Hopper, have all tea. Hopper. One of the more interesting things we got to do while we were there was repelling. And that was one of the only things that the Kurds would let us teach him because it was so fun. I would like to say that this is not uh, the most stupid thing that I ever do. Hey, Ahmad, here, Ahmad. Tamam. Uh, 
All right, he's almost up. Some of the more disappointing facts of Sinjar, as you may have guessed, is death. And sometimes you just can't escape it. Every two weeks or so, you're almost guaranteed to have an attack. And these attacks oftentimes result in death. The commander of the international unit in YBS is a man named Bajos. And to many of the Kurds in our unit, he's like a father. And to myself as well. And I remember on one occasion in particular, after one of the more severe bombings we had, one of the guys who was walking into our base was killed by a drone strike. And after that, one of my best friends, who's a Kurd named Kamal, he came to Bajos and he was having a talk about life and death. And it was such a weird thing for an older man like Bajos to be talking to a 20-something year old guy having to explain how death happens and how sometimes there's nothing you could have done. There's nothing you could do except press on. Life doesn't stop. The revolution doesn't stop. And we can't let the horrors of war keep us from doing our job. My last month in Sinjar would test pretty much everything I had learned so far. In true Sinjar fashion, the unexpected happened. We had a snowstorm roll through, covering all of our entrances and exits, preventing supply runs from coming up and giving us food and logistics. Our generator, which powers our electricity, couldn't work in this weather. All of our water was frozen. It was a tough time, but luckily, we were used to tough times. Gotcha. All right, come back inside. Make it a beat. The attacks continued, so we shoveled out our bunkers and we defended our position. The electricity was out, but we had learned how to make battery packs for the radios, so we converted one to be able to charge our power banks and our phones. Where's the sausage? Our sausage is covered, dude. Our food was running low. So we took this opportunity to go through the tunnels, which protect us from the weather, to the other bases, and to break bread with our Kurdish friends. So what are we getting ready for? We went through a lot that month, but it was nothing compared to everything we had done before this. So we kept high spirits, and we pressed on, as you do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Yeah, the juice. Please. <laughs> die. Some of the people I met in Sinjar would go back home and get married. Others would buy a house. Some would continue on with college. But for most, I would surprisingly meet again in Ukraine, carrying on the work as a freedom fighter. Go! Ta-da, 
a place called Taco Bell. It's a fast food restaurant in the U.S. I did something similar um, when I was 19. I went to um, Iraq to join up with the MHA. Uh, I saw everything that was happening here. I just decided to take that, uh, take that money, buy the plane ticket, and come out here. Yeah, you heard that right. This guy left his job at Taco Bell to go and fight the Russians. This film is my love letter to the freedom fighters of YBS. Slav Ushrashkari Havalan.